Let's take a few moments to review nursing care for the client experiencing hearing loss. At the conclusion of this video, the nurse should be able to identify the appropriate care for a client diagnosed with hearing loss. In caring for clients that are experiencing or diagnosed with hearing loss, you need to know the different diagnostic tests that may be implemented. The nurse needs to understand the difference between conductive loss and sensory neural loss. The nurse needs to know how to perform an ear irrigation. And the nurse needs to know the appropriate way to administer eardrops. When you are assessing the client that's experiencing hearing loss, you may see things such as the client is having difficulty understanding normal conversation, especially if they are in a noisy environment like a restaurant with a lot of background noise. The client may ask you or ask others to frequently repeat things. You may have a client who, whenever you are talking with them, who repeatedly says things like what or huh, again, wanting you to restate something because they simply didn't hear you and are not able to understand you. You may see the client turning their head to one side to favor the better ear. Clients may answer questions in an incorrect context, again, because they didn't understand the question, because they didn't correctly hear it. Or they may fail to respond to you completely, especially if they're not making eye contact or not looking at you. You ask a question or you make a statement and you may get no response at all. Other assessment findings can include complaints of vertigo or tinnitus. You may also hear that pronounced tinnitus. Complaints of pain especially if the cause of their hearing loss is from something like otitis media. The client may have fever, again, if the cause of their hearing loss is from infection. You may see discharge from the ear. Depending on the etiology of the hearing loss, especially in younger children, if they cannot hear, you will see speech delays. Your client may also undergo some personality changes such as irritability, depression. They may approach others with a sense of suspiciousness. Clients who cannot hear or have diminished hearing often feel socially isolated. Diagnostic testing to assess clients' hearing includes things like odiometry. Odiometry is often used as a screening test, and it can help you determine the extent and type of hearing loss that the client has. Of course, there's always the otoscope to actually look in the ear and see is there something like cerumen that's occluding the ear canal and assessing the tympanic membrane. You can use tuning fork test to assess a client's hearing, the Weber and the Rennie test. These tests help us determine between conductive versus sensory neural loss. In clients, again, depending on the etiology of their hearing loss, may require something like a CT scan or an MRI. Essentially, there are two types of hearing loss. With conductive hearing loss, there is a physical obstruction of sound wave transmission. So it could be something like a foreign body in the ear canal. It could be that the ossicles are fused. And so the sound waves are essentially blocked from reaching the inner ear nerve fibers. Conductive hearing loss, if we correct the underlying cause, there should be no to minimal permanent hearing loss for the client. Causes of conductive hearing loss are things like infection, inflammation, trauma, foreign body, excessive cerumen, otosclerosis, potential complications, of course, if if the hearing loss is related to infection, otitis, the client could develop meningitis. The other type of hearing loss is sensory neural. Sensory neural loss results from inner ear damage or damage to the eighth cranial nerve. It could be a brain injury itself. Things like exposure to loud music can cause this type of hearing loss as it damages the cochlear hair cells. Sensory neural loss is often permanent. We implement measures to prevent further hearing loss, 
or implement measures to amplify sounds in order to improve hearing for the client. Causes of sensory neural loss are congenital issues such as maternal exposure to different infections, infection in the client, ototoxic drugs, and this risk is increased in elderly clients because of our elderly clients, they often have impaired renal function, which then impairs their body's ability to clear the drug from their system. Trauma can cause sensory neural loss, exposure to loud music or loud noises. Meniere's disease. Potential complications with sensory neural loss could be tinnitus or tinnitus, vertigo, and vomiting. Presbycusis is a type of sensory neural loss that occurs as a result of the aging process. Your client could also have mixed hearing loss, which is a combination of both. In taking care of the client with hearing loss, let's talk about some measures that we would use for a client who's having conductive hearing loss. If their hearing loss is related to something like otitis media, uh, ear infection, or even otitis externa, you may need to apply heat for comfort. The client would be prescribed antibiotics very important to instruct the client to complete the prescription and not just stop the antibiotics once the symptoms resolve. Your client may need a hearing aid to help amplify sound when they have conductive hearing loss. Important teaching for this client is to introduce the use of the hearing aid slowly. Of course, you want the volume at the lowest in order for them to be able to hear sound. If you have the volume turned up really high, when you put the hearing aid in, you will hear this very loud squeal. It's actually uncomfortable and painful for the client, so you want the volume turned down low, and then increase the volume once the hearing aid is in place so the client can hear. They want to start using the hearing aid quite slowly, so having it in for just a few hours at a time and slowly increasing the duration that they leave the hearing aid in place. It's important to teach the client the proper care of the hearing aid, how to clean it, changing out the batteries, etc. We need to know how to perform an ear irrigation. This is a procedure we use to clear excessive earwax or cerumen from the ear canal. Important considerations is that you use warm tap water at a temperature that would be that of normal body temperature. We use a basin in order to collect the fluid that will be irrigated out of the ear and of course a towel. We use a syringe to pull up our warm tap water and the solution that you often use to irrigate the ear is hydrogen peroxide and water. You place the tip of the syringe into the client's ear at an angle. We don't want to flush the fluid in directly against the cerumen impaction. You want to use gentle but firm pressure. Don't try to blast or burst the fluid into the ear canal. If at any point in time the client complains of pain, you need to stop. Continue irrigating the ear. Normally about seven milliliters of fluid should flush it. You want to monitor your client. They may experience vertigo or nausea. And if that happens, you do need to stop the procedure. Once you complete the irrigation, and of course you're watching for the cerumen plug to irrigate out, have the patient turn to the side that was irrigated so that any remaining fluid can drain out. As always, it's important to wash your hands before and after any procedure. Prescription medications are often prescribed as eardrops. When you're instilling eardrops, remember with an adult client, you pull the ear upward and backward. If you have a child three years of age or younger, pull the ear downward and backward. Allow those drops to run down the inner canal of the ear and have the client lie on the unaffected side so that the ear drops can be absorbed. Surgery can include a cochlear implant if your patient has sensory neural hearing loss or if they have conductive loss, it could be something like tympanoplasty, 
For clients having surgery, we need to perform a pre-op hearing assessment to serve as their baseline. It's also important to wash the client's hair. The client needs to expect hearing loss post-op. Oftentimes this is due to the dressing or cotton packing that's placed down into the ear canal. And once that packing is removed, of course, they'll notice an immediate improvement. If the client has an actual incision, so they don't have cotton packed down in the ear canal, they may have an incision behind the ear. We reinforce that dressing if needed, we do not remove it. If there is bleeding, apply pressure and contact the healthcare provider. Important to teach the client to avoid blowing their nose or if they need to blow their nose, occlude just one nair and blow their nose gently with their mouth open. We want the client to avoid things like coughing and sneezing. With these surgical procedures, depending on the procedure that is performed, cranial nerve seven, eight, or 10 could be damaged or affected from trauma from the procedure or from postoperative edema. And so we need to monitor for facial nerve damage. This is usually transient. Other complications post-op are vertigo, tinnitus, and infection. You want to position the client on the unaffected side to diminish edema and pain. Very important to teach the client after ear surgery to avoid getting water in their ear. They need to avoid air travel due to the change in altitude. They need to avoid crowds or persons who have upper respiratory infections. With sensory neural hearing loss, it's important that we enhance communication with the client. When you're talking with a client, be sure that you're positioned in front of them so that they can see you or that you're near their better or unaffected ear. Make sure you're in a well-lit space and that it's a quiet environment. Be sure you have the client's attention. Speak slowly and clearly. Do not shout. Shouting and saying things louder doesn't guarantee that they will hear you. So be sure to keep hands and objects away from your mouth when you're speaking so the client can see your lips moving. To be sure the client understood you, have them repeat information back to you. Be sure to use appropriate hand motions. We always want to assess our client, and if your client can read, you know, write messages down or have printed materials to share with them. Other important teaching, especially if your client has had surgery, is to make a home health referral at post-op. Be sure to work with your client. Do they need assistive devices at home, such as a telephone that will light, you know, have a light system that with flashing lights that will let the client know the phone is ringing or that someone is ringing their doorbell? It's important, you know, we need to take into consideration things like, you know, smoke detectors. If I have hearing loss, if I can't hear, I'm not going to hear my smoke detector go off. So those are things we need to keep into account for this client once they go home. It is now time for a practice question. Engaging a hearing impaired client only when the client is alone may reinforce the sense of social isolation the client may already be experiencing. Pretending to understand the communication does not promote an open, honest nurse-client relationship. Written words or pictures of familiar phrases or objects prevent misunderstanding or erroneous communication. Ask the client to repeat statements, use appropriate hand motions, and write messages down if the client is able to read. A setting with many sounds will be too distracting. <laughs> 